Rather late than never is what they say. Our apologies, uh, but uh, it's been a fluid schedule here for South Africa's President Cyril Ramaphosa, of course, engaging with leaders at the highest level on the margins of the UN General Assembly, meeting with the Secretary General of the United Nations, engaging on issues of development, on issues of geopolitics, and we are very, very lucky and privileged to welcome uh, President Cyril Ramaphosa back to SABC News. Mr. President, welcome back to New York. Welcome back to SABC News. It's good to see you. Thank you very much. Good to see you as well, Sherwood. So one of the buzzwords, right, coming out of the BRICS summit, the G20 summit, the ASEAN summit, the G77 plus China summit, the UN General Assembly is the word multipolarity. But the, uh, the Secretary General calls it a positive development, Mr. President, in many ways in terms of balancing the international relations, the international order. But he warns that multipolarity in and of itself cannot guarantee peace. A multipolar world, he says, needs strong and effective multilateral institutions. Now, I know you have talked about the benefits of a multipolar society. Mm -hmm. Are you alive to the risks of such a society? Well, as uh, the Secretary General says, I mean, there are great benefits to a multipolar type of uh, geopolitical system. But there are obviously risks and dangers if things are not well handled, well managed, and well governed. So much as we welcome the multipolar system, we need to be sure that the various institutions, multilateral institutions, are well managed, well governed. For instance, I mean, starting off with the United Nations, the United Nations itself is really the fulcrum of the unity of the world. And it needs to be reformed. The Secretary General says so as well. And we've been calling for this institution to be reformed, particularly the United Nations Security Council, because it is not representative. It locks out 1.4 billion people on the African continent. We don't have a permanent voice, and we want a permanent voice. So once we reform that institution, then the multipolar system begins to gain better traction. Mm -hmm. It's better governed. We also look at the financial architecture of the world. That, too, locks out many developing economy countries. It was formed in 1945 and excluded and excludes till today many countries that are important that need financing. So that, too, must be reformed. That's what we are calling for. So once you have many, a number of institutions, like multilateral institutions, including formations such as BRICS in its expanded form, the G20, which has admitted Africa, and the G7, and if all these are well governed, they are representative, and they pay heed to the voices of the voiceless countries and nations in the world, then the multipolar system will function a lot better. So there's a lot that we must hope for rather than fear. You agree with me, Mr. President, that at this UN General Assembly, there has been a very strong developmental focus, right? The SDG Summit, the Climate Ambition Summit, the meeting on financing for development, where this issue of uh, international financial institutional reform is very much uh, front and center. Are you confident that the requisite reforms are going to happen in that space? You express your fr frustration that uh, these uh, the lack of commitment from the developing world in terms of uh, 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 official development assistance, in terms of uh, the Green Climate Fund, in terms of meeting the commitments they've made to developing countries, in terms of the just transition, are you satisfied that you, you now have the wind at your back in that regard? Well, we're not satisfied with the pace at which, for instance, the Sustainable Development Goals are being implemented. As the report says, we've only implemented 15% of what we set out to achieve in 2015, and we more or less on the halfway mark. And uh, we're still way off. And in regards to other uh, targets that we had, we were completely way off. And in some, we are going, to, going completely in the wrong direction. So there is a lot of work that still needs to be done. And everybody agrees that much work still needs to be done. But we also agree that the crises that the world has gone through, such as COVID, such as uh, the war right now as it is having an impact, such as uh, climate change, have been having a negative impact on our collective ability to achieve those goals. And it is certainly the case in our own country, 
because we also have suffered under the various, uh, various crises. So in the end, we need more assistance. That's why we support the Secretary General's call that we need $500 billion per year to ensure that we meet the targets of the Sustainable Development Goals. We support that because finance is needed. Many countries are under huge debt and many developing economies like ours are paying up to eight times more than your developed North countries for their debt. And it is hugely unfair, hugely inequitable that we pay eight times more than a country in Europe or North America. So those are the types of changes that we want. We want easier finance. We want concessional loans. We even want suspension of payment of loans when we are going through crises. I mean, we went through a COVID crisis and we had to go and borrow money so that our people can live. And that money now requires payment. And we are arguing that monies that have been borrowed for crisis prevention or addressing need to be treated differently. The statistic is that 3.3 billion people live in countries where they pay more on servicing their debt than they do on quality education That's and true. quality health care. Mr. President, another thing that is sucking finance away from the development agenda are, of course, wars and conflicts, which you lamented in your speech to the General Assembly yesterday. You, of course, are a leader in terms of the African Peace Initiative in relation to the war in Ukraine. You have met with uh, President Zelensky yesterday. You talked about some progress in terms of the return of children from Russia that were abducted to Ukraine. You talked about some progress in terms of prisoner swaps. Where are we in the conversation in terms of direct negotiations towards peace? Because I think we are moving in that direction, despite the Secretary General saying that the window of opportunity for direct talks does not exist at this point. What's your take on where we are in that conversation? Well, I think the Secretary General is right. The, that window is not open yet, but it is going to open. As we've always said, conflicts need to be resolved through negotiation. And in any event, every conflict does come to an end. Who's going to open the window? Well, we as African countries have been trying to open that window. And it is to this end that we suggested and put forward what we call confidence building measures. And one of those was movement of the grain. We've had a, a sort of a setback on that. The, re the return of the children, that at our instance as African nations is now moving ahead and South Africa is very intimately involved in that uh, with regard even to looking at the names and all that and locations where the children come from as well as the exchange of prisoners. So that during my conversation with President Zelensky was confirmed to be happening and he said at your instance as African countries, we are seeing movement and this is happening, which co uh, goes to confirm the correctness of the approach that we have taken. So with all that and b confidence building measures, the window will open. It must open because this war must come to an end. Is there a greater role, Mr. President, for BRICS in terms of ending this war in Ukraine? You have China in the room, you have India in the room, you have Brazil in the room, you have South Africa in the room. As a complement to your African Peace Initiative, is there a greater role for BRICS? Does BRICS have leverage when it comes to Ukraine and uh, the leader of the Russian Federation? Well, I'd like to believe so, and in fact, it is eminently so. And China has made proposals, Brazil has made proposals, proposals, so have the seven African countries, and those that are joining BRICS as well, the other countries we've admitted, the collective weight of all those countries, and many of them have one or so relationship with either Ukraine as well as Russia. So collectively, I do believe that we will be able to have some leverage, and uh, the le little leverage that we have is beginning to show some fruit in, in as far as confidence building measures. But I think in the end, the war will continue for a while, but it will come to an end as all wars 
do come to an end. Let's talk a little bit about the grain deal. I know you've had a bilateral with Turkey's president, uh, President Erdogan, uh, earlier today. I know the Secretary General is leaning on you a little bit in that regard. Uh, this, he says, is was his biggest diplomatic uh, victory since becoming Secretary General. As you know, Russia withdrew from uh, the deal. What are you offering the Russian Federation in terms of getting them back on track? Well, we are having deep discussions with them. Having been requested by the UN Secretary General, who asked us, the South Africa, to make some interventions, and we have, and our discussions with uh, President Putin continue in this regard, and there are quite a number of things that need to be unlocked, which we are dealing with, and I'm hopeful that as we discussed all those intricate matters that have to deal with the payment systems, that have to deal with the logistical part, we should be able to see an opening that will lead to the resuscitation. I want to make a quick transition to geopolitics, but it's all connected, right? Development issues, poverty, inequality, issues of decent work and unemployment are all connected to uh, the unconstitutional changes of government we've seen in Africa, in Sudan, mm -hmm. in uh, Mali, uh, mm -hmm. Niger, Gabon, and the list goes on. Of course, this is a big concern because it you know, takes focus away from uh, the development agenda that is so critical to us meeting the, 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 the 2030 uh, sustainable development agenda. Do we lack, Mr. President, the muscular diplomacy? I mean, despite the muscularity we've seen from regional blocs like ECOWAS threatening military action, we are not seeing these military juntas budge at the threat of a possible intervention. What can be done differently to arrest the trajectory we appear to be on in Africa? Well, in the end, adherence to democratic principles, adherence to insisting that the guns must be silenced, an adherence to the entire continent, putting its weight behind our regional bodies, supporting them and strengthening the various institutions, including the various uh, peacekeeping uh, forces that we should have on our continent. That too will add to the prevention of these coups. As we spoke as South Africa, we spoke very critically against uh, the various coups that we have had because coups go against the grain of the democratic wishes of ordinary people and they must end and they must be prevented and in the end we must also foster economic development in various countries on our continent so that our people can see that there's much to be gained from democratic governance or from economic progress than from taking power uh, militarily in the way that it has been happening. I want to stay a little bit longer on the African continent. Of course, you mentioned, uh, as South Africa does every year in a General Assembly speech, for the lifting of uh, sanctions in Cuba, which is not in Africa, to be clear, uh, <laughs> but also in Zimbabwe. I'll tell you what the U.S. president wrote to Congress when they renewed uh, the sanctions regime earlier this year. President Mnangagwa has not made necessary political and economic reforms that would warrant uh, terminating the existing targeted sanctions program, citing continued repression and intimidation of citizens, absence of reforms on rule of law, democratic governance and protection of human rights. They are also uh, pointing to the SADC uh, Observer Missions Report that pointed to uh, issues of credibility and, and process in terms of the election. Yet you, Mr. President, were at the inauguration. You congratulated President Mnangagwa. How do you thread that needle given what SADC has said and what the United States is saying? Well, let's get it right. What uh, was said by a representative of the Observer Mission uh, is still got to be discussed in SADC because it's not a final report. And if one looks at that report, it actually says there were challenges, challenges with regard to a number of things that have to do with elections. And nearly every, many countries around the world have such challenges. The United States is you know, a prime example uh, with regard to their last election. So there are challenges, and they have said in the report, as I read it, that certain things need to be improved. They have not declared the election as uh, invalid, unfree, and unfair. They have highlighted certain challenges. Problems with transparency, independence, fairness and credibility of all stages of the electoral process. That's yeah. what the report says. Well, that, indeed. And there, those are challenges that need to be addressed. 
what was challenges uh, that would be un unacceptable in the South African context. Well, the, where there's a lack of transparency, we need to, they need to come up with the details. And I would say yes, let the details be put forward so that we can deal with them. So we are waiting to receive that report at the SADC level so that we can deal with it. Because it, if anything, it was an interim report. Okay. So once the report is put to the SADC body, we will then debate it. And we will also hear representations from Zimbabwe, as well as from the observer mission as well. So there's been geopolitical concerns, development concerns on this visit, but there have also been national concerns. You met with, uh, uh, in a business dialogue with uh, mm. member, leaders of uh, industry in the United States, uh, hosted by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Uh, what's the big takeaway from that, right? The big conversation in, in the South African U.S. context has been around South Africa's retention with uh, a preferential statement, uh, uh, status within the African Growth and Opportunity Act. There were questions about whether South Africa was going to host the AGOA Forum because uh, members of Congress were petitioning President Biden to remove it over all sorts of allegations which have since been proven not to be valid. Uh, where do we stand in that conversation? Well, the meeting with the U.S. business uh, people under the ages of the U.S. Chamber uh, of Commerce, the South Africa U.S. Chamber of Commerce, was possibly one of the best meetings I've heard. Because here we were meeting with the top business people of major companies that have invested in South Africa. We've got some 600 companies or so in U.S. companies that have invested in South Africa. It was a hugely positive meeting, and they all confirmed that South Africa is a good destination. And in fact, their narrative and their storytelling was far much more positive than we often get from South African business. And they were saying, yes, they, there are challenges all over the world where they operate, but they are seeing progress. They are seeing progress with our reform program, they are seeing progress with nearly everything, the logistics, the energy, as well as on the crime side. They are seeing that we are making progress. But what they were heartened by was our ability as a government to work with business to address their concerns from visa issues right through to the ease of doing business. I mean, it is big companies like Amazon, Google, IBM, Caterpillar, and you name them, and uh, uh, PepsiCo, Amazon. Amazon was there. And all these companies were talk, speaking positively about their investments. In, and in fact, they want to increase their investments. And some of them were saying, we would like to see a situation where there are 1,200 companies, U.S. companies investing here. And um, we've just had really positive news because... The Agoa Forum, uh, which there was a doubt whether it would be held in South Africa, is now going to be held in November. Minister of Trade and Industry and Competition was in Washington, and they made the announcement together with the U.S. Secretary uh, of Commerce and all that. So positive developments. The U.N. General Assembly moment is a great platform for South Africa. Uh, this is where we are able to interact at bilateral level in the UN uh, Assembly itself, in the various sub-activities uh, that go on. So we've had a really good tour here mm. in the United States, and I go back home feeling very, 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 my spirits are lifted. But before you go, Mr. President, let me just challenge you on this notion of progress, right? Find the U.S. business community seems very optimistic mm. and hopeful about the future. But progress is, is a feeling, I, I mm. imagine. For many people in South Africa, they're struggling through the power cuts, the load shedding, mm -hmm. the infrastructure deficits. There were roads exploding in Johannesburg. There was a building that burned down. Uh, how do you align progress with what people are feeling and seeing in South Africa? Well, in the end, progress has very much to do with how people are experiencing their own lives and the evidence they see on the ground. It has very much to do with that. So I am not diluting that. Uh, people are going through very difficult times. And I always say so, that poverty is, is grinding. We are addressing the issue of poverty on a number of levels. 60% of our budget is geared towards social welfare and looking after our people. I know of no other country 
certainly on our continent and in other parts of the world, where 60% of your budget is, is geared towards looking after the interests of your people. So we're trying, we're doing quite a lot. The energy crisis, we are addressing it. And we are beginning to see movement. And people are already seeing the evidence. Although a week or two ago we went through to load six again, it's tapering down. And by the end of the year, we will have seen even greater progress. And at local government level, still a challenge, but we're making progress on a number of other areas, water, uh, the roads we are attending to, and the unemployment is a major, major challenge. We lost two million jobs as a result of COVID. We're regaining them. In the last three years or so, we have created many of the jobs that were lost during COVID. And we want to create more, and we're moving forward. And we continue to give hope to our people. The issue of the empowerment of women, which I raised the General Assembly. I heard you. And uh, very proudly declaring that South Africa is making moves on empowering the women of South Africa, although we are still far behind. Gender-based violence continues to be a horrible scourge. And together with various civil society organizations, we are doing what we can, and we need to do more. And the message that I would put out is that there are challenges, huge challenges, and by no means are we saying uh, we, we are addressing all of them, but we are addressing as many of those challenges as we possibly can. Staying with the, the business forum and, and the, your engagement here, Mr. President, what I know about investors is that they like uh, they like assurance, they like mm -hmm. predictability. Yeah. South Africa is, of course, moving into an unpredictable phase, as one does when you move into an election uh, period. There are all sorts of rumors and polls that say certain things about the African National Congress and how they're going to dip below 50 percent and what that could mean. Uh, how do you assure investors about the policy prescriptions you are putting forward, uh, given that there is so much uncertainty in what might happen next year? Well, certainty for business people is very important because when they uh, craft their own budgets and their own plans, they want to know that the laws and regulations and everything else is going to stay the same. That's how they peg their business plans. So I can say certainty is a big issue for us. We want policy certainty. We want our policies to be consistent with our ambitions, with the vision that we have set out for the country uh, to improve the lives of our people. And where things are not fit for purpose, like laws and regulations, we should change them. And where we are able to accommodate business so that it functions better, we should be able to do so. And creating that balance is important. And that is the whole issue about certainty. Right. And because business people want to be told what the regulations are. And once they are told, they would like us to stick to the message that we have put forward. And that's exactly what we are seeking to do. And we will make and continue to make South Africa a fr business friendly environment because it leads to job creation. It leads to the progress that we want to see in our country. So you're going to host the AGOA Forum, but of course the bigger conversation is South Africa's retention within the African Growth and Opportunity mm -hmm. Act. Come uh, the renewal in 2025, of course the Lady R issue, uh, relationships with the United States, a lot of friction, uh, calling in the ambassador uh, that, that made those allegations, <laughs> a, a panel, investigative panel report finding no evidence to uh, validate uh, claims of weapons transfers and ammunition transfers. I wonder why we haven't seen a walk back publicly from the United States, and I wonder if that bothers you. No, a walk back in terms of what, going back Saying, to... well, you know, we made a mistake maybe, or you're right, sorry. Well, Shouldn't yeah. have done that. Look what we did to your economy. Yeah. Why hasn't that happened? Well, the United States is a big economy country, and uh, it's, it's sometimes very difficult for big players like that to sometimes uh, do things like that. What I did do when I was in India, I had a side discussion with President Biden, and uh, we said we must re reconnect and ensure that our relationship is on even keel. He said that's exactly what we must now proceed to because 
it's important for South Africa and the United States to have a good relationship. So at that level, things are going to continue going well. I also had a discussion with the Secretary of Treasury, exactly the same. The Minister of Trade and Industry is in Washington, as it is now. Minister of uh, International Relations is going to meet her counterpart in Washington. So from a relationship point of view between South Africa and the United States, we are good. And I don't think we should be trying to, to play to what has happened in the past. It did a lot of damage to us. But I'd like us to move on. I'd like us to ensure that we have a solid relationship. We want to be retained in Agoa, because mm -hmm. Agoa uh, has created a lot of jobs in our country. So I don't want to continue hankering to the past. I want us to have a very firm relationship. We've learned a lot from this Lady R incident, which we investigated and we shared our report, I mean, what we released with them, and uh, they have accepted that, but don't accept, don't uh, expect that they are going to, uh, as it were, uh, uh, do certain do things. Do an about turn. Yes, don't expect that. They are just a big country, and we want to concentrate on buttoning down our relationship with them, and uh, that will continue on even keel and even get better because they see, as the United States, the value that they also get from our participation and the free trade uh, deal we have with them through AGOA. So it's a mutually beneficial relationship. And why spoil it? So we move on and make sure that we continue having a good relationship. I'm getting the rap sign, and I know you've got a flight to catch back to South Africa, so let me end with this. Uh, I think former President Nelson Mandela was able to lift the trophy. I think former President Thabo Mbeki was able to lift the trophy. You yourself have been able to lift the uh, uh, Rugby World Cup trophy. You might get an opportunity to do so a second time. South Africa is playing Ireland, which is the big guns in the group on Saturday. Mr. President, what is your message to the Springboks? My message is simple to the Springboks. Go, Boke, go and win on Saturday, beat the Irish, and then our route is very clear to the final. And I will definitely myself go to the final to ensure that we lift that trophy for the fourth time. And I think the Springboks have it with them. They are playing extremely well. They are strong. Right. They are focused. They've got good leadership in Sia Colisi. Uh, so all of us must be rooting for them. I was going to ask uh, that you take me along with you, but you might have to make a detour via New York. Mr. President, <laughs> good to see you. Thanks so much and safe travels uh, back to South Africa. Thank South you. Africa's head of state, uh, President Cyril Ramaphosa, speaking exclusively to SABC News at the conclusion of his high-level visit to the United Nations, to business in New York City he takes back uh, a lot of discussions, a lot of interesting discussions with those business leaders, with geopolitical leaders, and certainly uh, the leaders of the multilateral system here in New York. It's exclusive to SABC News. You're very, very welcome. Thanks for watching. Back to you in studio.